So let me start out by saying I've got my name in the pack, uh, my uh, presentation called Looking for Packets in All the Right Places. Uh, I wanted to find the song, uh, that old country song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places, but uh, I've decided not to go down there. So I'll just sing it to you there. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, looking for packets is always a challenge. Finding them in the midst of all the craziness that you have in your network, looking for packets in the right places and finding the right packets is a key thing to being able to successfully diagnose problems and to be able to uh, track down things with your Wireshark. So I'll kick it off here and move to the next slide to start us off. Uh, my name is Patrick Kennison. People call me Pat. I'm a senior WAN analyst with Southern Farm Bureau Casualty Insurance Company. Uh, been with them for about the last 15 years. Before that, I worked in the construction industry. Um, and for the last 30 odd years, I've been a network engineer uh, in the real world, in the trenches, uh, making uh, networks work. Uh, my current job function is WAN analyst, as you see there, uh, which simply means I make remote people talk allow them into our network via that VPN, via site-to-site -site VPNs, via uh, fiber links, however they might want to get into our network securely and safely, that's my job is I, is I work through those. Uh, as you can imagine, it's been a very busy couple of years for me. Uh, if we rewind back to March of last year, which by the way, was the last time I stepped foot in my real office. I'm working for home here in Cabot, Arkansas. Um, we uh, at Farm Bureau uh, had maybe 100, 150 remote users. And all of a sudden in a heartbeat, the very next Monday, that was Friday the 13th on March the 13th, and it was announced that we were gonna be going to remote working. And by Monday, we had over 5,000 remote workers. Uh, needless to say, my internet pipe felt that. Uh, and we have been working with our internet pipe ever since then to try to make sure that people don't flood us with stuff. Um, uh, I graduated from the University of Central Arkansas in 1991. Uh, Actually, oddly enough, with a degree in music education of all things, uh, I decided I didn't want to be a band director, and I went into networking, and I've been doing it for 30 plus years now. So uh, I want to start out by telling you a little story about some, some kids. A couple of kids went into the woods, and as they went in the woods, they saw this big, gigantic hole, and this hole was very deep. And one boy looked at the other boy and said, well, how deep do you think this hole goes? And they yelled down the hole, hey, and they listened and they didn't hear an echo. A boy grabbed a rock and threw a rock down the hole and they listened for it till it fell down to see if they could hear it hit the bottom. They never heard it. Hmm. They grabbed even a bigger rock and they threw it into the hole and they listened and they listened and they never heard it hit the bottom. Now the boys were really challenged. They looked around, they saw this railroad tie. That's that big piece of wood that separates on the railroad ties. And they went over and each of them grabbed one end of the railroad tie and the other one grabbed the other and they hefted it over to the edge of the hole and they threw it into the hole and they listened and they listened. And about that time, a goat pops out of the woods near them and is running just full speed. I mean, as fast as it could go, it ran. It was running right for the hole, jumps right in the hole and it's gone. The boys are just looking at each other like, what in the world just happened? About that time, a farmer walks out of the woods and says, has anybody seen my goat? And the boy said, as a matter of fact, we just saw a goat. He was running toward the hole at full speed and jumped right into this hole. And the farmer said, well, it could have been my goat. He was tied to a railroad tie. <laughs> so <laughs> I say that joke because it's kind of funny. But also to kind of illustrate, sometimes we dive down these holes when we're searching for true solutions in our environment. And those holes go deeper and deeper and deeper and they seem like they never end. They call me the bloodhound around here because I go down in those holes and I find those things that are going on on our network. So I'm gonna to talk today about that. Uh, as I am from Arkansas, I wanna briefly kind of show you a few sites of Arkansas so you know what Arkansas is all about. To begin with, this is a picture of some waterfall that is in uh, Petty Jean Mountain State Park. Been there many times, it's beautiful. 
this is off Pinnacle Mountain, just outside of Little Rock, Arkansas. This one is uh, a beautiful point up in the Ozark Mountains in Northwest Arkansas, near the home of Walmart. Uh, that's Washita, uh, that's the Washita River right there. And finally, one of my favorite places that's just a few miles from my home, Woolly Hollow State Park. Some beautiful scenery here in Arkansas. But one of the things Arkansas has is that it is a natural state to go hunting in. I grew up hunting and hunting is a passion here in Arkansas. Uh, when you go hunting, for example, the opening day of deer season, they close schools in a lot of parts of Arkansas because it's that many kids will go hunting with their families. So usually you all pack up and you head for deer camp. So here's some words to live by if you ever come to Arkansas or you go to a deer camp. What happens in deer camp never happened. So uh, when you're going hunting, it's always good to know your game. Know what you're looking for. This guy right here is a little squirrel. Now outside my backyard right now, uh, I fight these squirrels off because they're after my bird feeders. Uh, but these guys have a habitat that they live in. It's always good to know the habitat that you're what you're hunting lives in. Uh, this is pine trees and this is hardwoods. When you ask the question, where does this little guy most often live when you're going hunting for him? Well, the obvious answer is the hardwoods because in the hardwoods is where the nuts are. So, you know, it's always good to know your name, uh, your habitat, your game. So here's the tree that's in, uh, that grows here in Arkansas and in the Southern United States. This tree is a beautiful tree. It has, adds a lot of shade and it blooms really beautiful colors during the fall. It has berries on it that look something like this. Now, I kid you not, the name of that tree is a persimmon and they're deer candy. These persimmons in the fall begin to ripen and fall off the trees. And those little deer will come and eat it and eat it and eat it. So if you're hunting for deer, set up your deer stand or your deer blind as close to these persimmon trees as you can because they're gonna be deer there. So I say all that to point out that when you're hunting for things, you gotta know what you're hunting for. And because when the call comes that my network is slow, you've got to know where to start looking. Uh, it's easy to blame the end user, you know, blame me. Uh, you're the one typing with one finger. And I have a lot of users that do that. But uh, you've got to know what you start looking for and start asking questions. So we have some tools of the trade. Now I like to, I, I've got a tool belt. I call it my propeller head tool belt that uh, I wear. And that tool belt, just like a carpenter, uh, you have tools that you use, hammers uh, being one of them. And I like to call my 10,000 pound sledgehammer, one of the most obvious ones is ping. So I know this is simplistic guys, but I wanna start out this session by having a conversation about ping. Now, Ping is a tool that has in Windows and it's in Linux, but I think people use Ping uh, and will find that there's some things you can do with Ping and see how it reacts in Wireshark that can tell you some things about what's going on on your network. So I want to do a quick demonstration and my first, whoop, I'm going to go back to my previous one here. I'm going to do a quick demonstration of Ping real quick because Ping, I'm gonna open Wireshark here. And in my Wireshark, I'm gonna select my ethernet adapter here on my local PC. And I'm just going to filter down. Now, if you don't know, you can filter down by all kinds of protocols. You can just do TCP, you can do UDP, you can type host and type in a Pacific IP address. and it would only capture to and from that host. You could have to hold networks and that whole subnet would be captured. So my point is you can filter, this is before it ever gets captured, it will start the capture and only capture what you select right there. So in this case, I'm gonna put ICMP in because I just wanna look at the pings. So, I'll open a command prompt here. 
and start out by going ping. There's a whole lot more to ping than just ping. <laughs> you can actually source ping. You can actually uh, repetitively uh, make it repeat over and over again. You could even do name resolution. So I'm just going to do a basic ping right now. So four pings, 32 bytes of data from my workstation. And we captured the traffic here. Now, I know this is simple, but it's kind of gives you some good information to understand. Uh, you notice the payload 74 right here. Uh, it said 32 bits. Why does it say 74? There's overhead there that yeah, if you uh, in a packet, but it only has 32 bits of data. If you look at the payload, the actual payload, you'll notice the payload is A through W and it starts repeating over again. That's the bit 61 through 6F and then 70 through 7F and then or 77. And then it starts over again with 61 through 6F. So the more, the larger the packet, it'll just keep repeating that over and over again. There's utilities you can use to actually change what the payload is, but by default, Windows payload is actually uh, these alphanumeric characters here. So when you ping something, uh, you get a request and a reply. Now, on this very first ping, I want to show you something here, something that immediately sticks out that a lot of people don't realize. Wireshark tells you exactly what's going on. If you look here, the packet, the request went out at 1742.33. In point one four five four eight two, and it and I got a reply. Oh, about sixty milliseconds later. Let's do the math and actually see that uh, two zero nine five zero two minus one four five four eight two. Sixty four thousand oh two four. Let's take a look back at our ping. Sixty four milliseconds. That's exactly right. What it is is. It actually is registering how long it took for the packet to come back. That's what a ping does. Now, I know you're going, duh, I know that. But I want to tell you some more here about this. In this packet, there is something called a time to life, TTL. Now, in the packet itself, that is going to be right here underneath the internet protocol. Time to life is 126. It starts out with a number. In Windows, it's 128. And for each router that it passes along the way between point A and point and where you're pinging, it actually decrements down the time to life. So if you pass a router and it forwards the packet to the next device, it lowers it down. So logically speaking, I'm at 128 when I start. When I get the packet back, I'm at 126. That means somewhere along the way, I've had three decrements down, 127, 128, 127, 126. So logically, I'm three hops away. Let's see if that fits the profile here. And I'm going to put a dash D so it doesn't resolve names here. Sure enough, I'm three hops away. So my point is, you can actually know inside your network a path that's being taken simply by the trace route. So I'm going to do one a little bit longer this time, just so that you can see it. I'm going to ping all the way across into a different network entirely. This one's got 76 milliseconds. And again, time to life. But look how much it does. It's different. Look at here. 123, so how many hops do we have? 128, 127, 126, 125, 124, 123, six hops. So let's see if I, let's see if it fit, it follows that. One, two, three, four, five, six. So just from a ping, that simple utility we all know about, we can tell how many routers, how many paths we took to get to a certain location. And you could even do that going out to the internet. Let's see what happens when we go out to the internet. I'm gonna to go to yahoo.com. I'm 120, 
10 milliseconds away from Yahoo right now. So let's see how many we got. Wow. <laughs> 46, 128, 44, 46 hops. So if I do a trace route, I bet we're going to have a lot of hops here. <laughs> let's see. So I, I won't sit here and watch the whole thing, but I bet we're going to get down to 44. Uh, we're we're going to have more than that, 128 minus 44. So that's going to be somewhere around 80 hops. Well, I don't think we're going to go out that far. But what we will do along the way, different routers can actually change the TTL. We only have 19. But you can uh, the routers can actually change the TTL along the way. So it's not always 100% trustworthy. But what it is, is especially within your network, when you know the hops, that TTL can be very, very helpful. So that's that's a couple of uh, a couple of little hints with ping. A couple of other things, and I'll tell you a little story to go along with what I'm about to tell you. Uh, we had a new ESX server installed into our environment, and all of a sudden, uh, it looked like it was great. Everything was up and running. We were able to talk to it. We ping it. We can. It's all good. I turn it over uh, the network over to. Uh, our server engineers, and the next day I get a phone call. And the phone call says, I can't open the web page, such and such web page on a server that's in this. And I said, Well, you can ping it. And he, sure enough, he could ping it. But he couldn't, uh, he couldn't open the page, which was uh, actually an SSL web page. And what was happening was between me and this ESX server, there was actually a misconfiguration of the MTU size. So you could actually ping. That's just fine. That's 32 bits of data. What if I were to up the length dash L to 1400? That's still all good. What if I were to up the length to 1500? That's all good because an average, uh, a standard packet size, MTU size is 1500. But what if I do 1600? And the answer is, and what the answer to the problem was, is when you pass the 1500 mark, if you don't have jumbo frames in, enabled on your switches, it's going to fragment the packets. Let me go down to the bottom down here. And sure enough, take a look at the pings down here when I got down to the bottom. It's fragmenting the packets into smaller packets. And there's multiple packets in the payload. And it, you see it's adding all these A through Ws. So with that in mind, what I was able to do was determine that Jumbo Frames was not enabled on the ESX server correctly. And he was not able to get to what he needed to get to because the Jumbo Frames was enabled. Enabled Jumbo Frames. Fragmentation didn't occur and everything was happy. <laughs> By the way, there's one more command dash F, which means don't fragment the packet. And you'll get that if you only have 1500 MTU when you do that. So uh, enough talking about ping. I hope you guys got a little bit of something out of that because ping is a tool that is pretty powerful, but uh, a lot of people don't use it. Earlier today, I had a user call and say, uh, my internet's very slow. It's dropping packets. And I pinged from my primary data center. And sure enough, it was dropping packets like crazy. I pinged from my workstation and he wasn't dropping a single packet. It was rock solid. I pinged from my opposite data center, which has a different internet source, by the way. And this happened to be a remote worker and his was rock solid. And that ping allowed me to track down exactly what was going on because I pinged from the different sources and different angles. And I was able to track down that it was my internet pipe coming and going out of uh, my primary data center that was the source of the problem. Uh, my point is this, that ping is a tool. It's a big tool in your tool chest. Um, my next thing I want to talk about is Dump cap from the command line. 
Wireshark isn't just a GUI tool. If you guys don't know this, there's a I, there's only so much that the GUI can actually capture as you're turning on a Wireshark capture. Uh, and I want to demonstrate for you what Wireshark dump cap is, and so that you can be able to use dump cap at the command line and capture things much faster and capture big packets, a lot of packets. Because if you're capturing an interface that is like an internet, a one gig interface going out to the internet and it's completely full, that's gonna capture a lot of packets a lot uh, real quick and it's gonna fill up that buffer in the GUI extremely quick. And it'll lock up, it'll shut that, it'll shut Wireshark down. So uh, I'll just demonstrate for you here. I'm gonna pull up uh, another little utility here. Give me, a, give it a second to connect here. Uh, to reconnect. Um, and I'm doing this because I want to capture, uh, show you dump cap and actually capture something so that you can see it. So I'm in a command prompt right here. And dump cap has a whole lot of information in it. If you do dash question mark with dump cap, uh, it has a lot of different things. The first thing that I want to show you is dump cap dash D, capital D. And what dump cap dash capital T does is it actually shows you uh, what interfaces are assigned to what uh so you can select the interface that you want to capture. In this case, I'm on a management server that's got a lot of different ports that, I'm mon that I've got monitor ports set up on some switches in my environment. Just curious, can you guys, uh, I'm going to ask Naomi real quick. Naomi, can you guys see the, uh, the text of the command line right here pretty mm -hmm. clearly? Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, so you've got dump cap. And in this case, I want to capture the core one, which in this case is interface number seven, dash seven. So you just do dash I seven. And if you look at the command up here, dash I, lowercase I is selecting the interface. You can actually put a capture filter on it here, dash F and show me only ICMP. Because that's the you know just like we did at the at the main GUI, you can be able to capture that. But I'm not. I'm just going to capture everything because I want to show you something bigger. Um, there's commands to actually dictate how long the capture can go. Uh, in this case, I'm going to talk about the buffer size right here. Uh, cap buffers can only go so far, but I'm going to increase my buffer here to 20 meg, and that's in megabyte, so that it can capture more and save more in a buffer before it writes. So it, if things are going really fast, it can write to the disk. So I'm gonna do buffer 20. And then there's a lowercase b, and that's called a ring buffer. Now this is kind of neat. I wanna create a whole bunch of capture files with the maximum size file of being one gigabit. That's 1,000 megabit, megabytes. So megabytes. So that's one gigabit, one megabit. Okay, so you got dash B for file size. Dash A, duration. How long do I want to do it? And there's different options for dash A, but this is how long it goes. It can go duration. It can stop after a certain mile, uh, file size certain number of files, certain number of packets. So you can actually make this capture stop after certain things. In this case, I'm just gonna do a 60 second capture. And then I'm gonna go dash in for, in being for um, making it do piece, uh, it'll do a PCAP in, uh, PC, it'll, it'll put it in the format of PC, uh, PCAP NG so that it can use that format instead of just standard PCAP. And that's nano, that makes it go into smaller nanoseconds. Uh, and finally, dash W, and then the file name. 
test capture. Okay, and I'm gonna start this capture. And it's capturing a lot. It's already up to one point, actually 200,000. It's around 1.3 million packets is when we typically cross that one gigabit spot and it creates a new file. So see if I'm right, see if I, I follow right here. Should be kicking over to a new file any second. Oh, 1.26, okay. So what's happening right now in this directory, if you go look at the directory that this is saving in, and this happens to be this one right here, it's creating how many ever files it needs to do the 60 second capture. It's up to the second one right now. And they're only one gig, so they're manageable in size. So, so it did 60, in 60 seconds, it did, uh, it captured 100% of the packets, it captured about close to 3 million packets uh, in that 60 seconds and it divided them up into files. So with that in mind, we we're able to capture these things in a very quick way. So just know this, that this gives you a lot more flexibility when you have large captures that you need to capture. Then you can begin to divvy up and take a look. We're gonna be looking at some captures I've made this way that I've anonymized and actually talking about them. So, uh, so that's general thing. I want to stop right here before we go too deep here. Anybody have any questions about uh, about dump cap or what I've talked about so far before I dive into some packet captures here? Any questions? Okay. Moving on then. Uh, Let's dive into a packet capture here. My, uh, so the first thing you need to do when you're hunting for game or, or you're hunting for packets is know what the area looks like. Know your, the area that you're hunting, meaning know your network. Uh, so it's always a good idea to baseline your network before so that you can be able to know what's unique or different when something's not right. Um, and in this case, I'm gonna show you a packet capture, what I call the baseline packet capture. And we're gonna go through this packet capture and show you how to analyze how the traffic looks here inside the packet capture. So let me pull it up here. And I'm gonna quit this, which is the, the pings that we were doing and open up the first one. So this packs, this captures about 1.3 million uh, packets. So it's not too awfully big, uh, but it is a capture of the pathway to the internet. Uh, so what we're gonna see is a lot of different things coming in here. Uh, so first thing, when I see a packet like this, so the, let's set up the scenario for this capture. Users are calling in and they say, well, the internet's slow. Well, this would be a place where I would capture would be, uh, the outbound interface heading toward the internet uh, on my network. So this is a capture heading out toward the internet for this uh, for my network. Uh, there's a lot of different things I, I can visually see here. I can scan through these things and visually see there's some numbers that are coming up over and over again. That 20.25 number, 20.20 number is coming up over and over again. But there's a better way to do this. Right here inside Wireshark, there is actually some built-in utilities that let you see who are the top talkers. Under statistics here, and if you look at conversations, 
Now it opened up in a different window here, so I'll pull it over. It analyzes this packets and it's going through all my packets right now. As you can see, it's loading them up and deciding. Just takes a little bit of time for the 1.3 million packets to finish. And I'm looking at just IP4. I'm gonna look at the number of packets. And if you look right here, the top three talkers are 20.7, 20.20, 20.25. Now, how much are they really doing? And this is a baseline. We're, we're looking at it. So during normal conversation, it looks like these three IP addresses seem to be the top talkers here um, and the ones that take up most of the bandwidth. And you see them over and over again here talking to different hosts. So let's take a look at what we can do to know just how these guys do. You can actually dig into one of these guys simply by right clicking on this, applying a filter and you can go, show me a filter selected between packet A and B. So now this is going to go and grab just this conversation. And it's resorting the, pack, the packets behind us here. I'm going to move this down while it's doing that. And when it finishes, you're going to see what, what kind of conversation this is on the top talker. So this lets you go, OK, this is the top talker. What is he doing? OK. Hmm. It's UDP protocol. Payload size is a good size packets. That's full size packets here, 1320, 1320. And it's going from port 52055 to port 443, UDP port 443. Hmm, if you know your network, Cisco AnyConnect clients can use port 443 for their VPNs into the office. So this guy's actually a VPN talking into our office, inbound into our office. Uh, so that, that's valid traffic. You know what? It, so you can identify the traffic pretty quickly. UDP port 443. Uh, let's look at some other here. There's another thing called IO graph. An IO graph. Let's try that again, reopen my packet here. Sorry about that. If you get, in case you didn't know, we just had a Wireshark crash. <laughs> I didn't let this load fully before I did the IO graph. FYI, that's a good idea to do. Don't try to do more than one thing while it's trying to load all your packets. You'll get the results I just had. Statistics. IO graphs. Now, what does IO graphs do here? Pull it up here. What this just did is analyze the packets, and it's still analyzing here. Let me go back and do it again. Okay. It's looking at all the packets and seeing how much bandwidth is being used by all the packets in this capture. And I've got it in a one second interval right now. Now, the number up here is nine times 10 to the eighth. Now, if you do a, pull up a trusty little calculator here like we had before, and you do nine, times 10 to the eighth, you get 900 million. Now, if you don't know how many bits that is, you can all go out to a trusty website here and put 
900 million in. Hang on, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's lower than I expected, hang on. Let's try this again. Let's do it to megabits. Okay, so that turns out to be 900 megabits. Now, I have a one gigabit pipe. <laughs> well, we're getting pretty close here. It's, it's, have to, it's going pretty darn good right now. So as you can see, that represents 900 megabits. Now, I, that's the only thing I wish, you know, I guess we could put out an enhancement request is when you're doing this, this eight times 10 to the eighth power, you have to do some translating. Now, you can also come down here and do microburst. And so show me the interval, just I'm gonna drop down to 100 megabits per second and see if it's any bigger for that. Notice it's nine and it's 10 to the seventh at that time because we've stepped down one zero in the, but that's still right at 900 megabytes across that at 100 megabits. Okay, so let's step down even further. Let's show it at one millisecond level. So basically we're looking at packets at the one millisecond level. And at the one millisecond level, we're getting about at times bursting over that number. So as you can see, you can adjust your time by gets very tight and it takes a lot longer to load these when you do that. So I'm gonna stop it here so we can go back. I'm just gonna go back to one second just for our purposes of this demonstration because I wanna show you some more stuff. So we've got this baseline. We, we know how much is in the entire packet. So let's look at our top three statistics once again. So one of our top three was that trusty AnyConnect VPN. So I want to see everything coming and going from Okay, so these are just those packets. Now show me the IO graph for that. And it's pulling up the IO graph on my other screen, so I'll pull it over here. Now there's two lines. Notice it's actually doing it in packets right now. You can change this right here into the Y axis to bits instead of packets. Let's stop it here. And I'm going to have it start again. So our top talker So I'm having it show me both the top talker and that dot seven IP address. Are all the all the packets are this line here at the top, and just the packets I'm interested in which is focused on that VPN traffic is this right here. So I've now created a graph showing me that my VPN traffic of this traffic that I have right here, my VPN traffic is between a little underneath 200 megabytes. So the whole package is about 850 to 900 megabytes, 200 megabytes. Let's take it one step further here. You could actually, expound on this graph. Let's take the next top talker, number 20. OK, 
And as it loads this one up, you're able to go to statistics, IO graph again. And again, it just adds to it. And I'm going to change it to packets here. Packets to bits. Make it start over again here. And so the next top talker. we see is right at 400 megabits per second in the bandwidth. That's this line right here. Once again, the VPN traffic is about 200 megabits per second. And the total traffic is 900 megabits per second. So we're beginning to low in on that. So we got 400 plus 200, so that's 600. So 600 of this 800, is already being chewed up so you know what your traffic looks like. One more, and then we'll move on to the next capture here. Uh, let's do dot 25, the third stop talker. By the way, this stop talker is uh, point, uh, site to site VPNs in my environment. And we go back, IO graphs. And I will change it again. It always defaults to packets instead of bits. I'll stop it until it start again. And that's when that's doing all four of these now. Look at there, the green line is now the third top talker. So between these top talkers, we pretty much have all of our network traffic, 400 megabits, a little over 200 megabits, a little under 200 megabits, 400, 200, 200, that's roughly 800. And then the other stuff is out there. So I baseline my network right now. I know that my top talkers are paths to the internet, I know any connect VPN traffic and how much there is. I know site to site VPN traffic and how much there is. So now when I have a problem, I baseline to know exactly what is out there. So we can go on to see what's different when we have a bigger packet or we have something going on. So this is without problems. So let's go look at a packet capture when things have gone south. Moving back. So some of the most common things that you want to look for in your network to capture things are your switches, your router, your VPNs, your firewalls, and of course your host and clients. Always the best point of reference when you have something is to capture as close to the client that's having a problem as you can. That way, you don't have NAT translation issues. You don't have all these things that can get in the way. Uh, and I think anybody who analyzes captures will tell you that. Uh, try to capture as close to it as you can. If you're a network administrator like myself, you don't always have that luxury. Uh, capturing at the closest switch would be the next logical place to capture, uh, or at the router, or at the VPN or firewall as it's coming. So the first step is to understand what is normal on your network. The next thing is understanding what has changed. Uh, this conversation, uh, in the packet you're about to see, is one that happens, has a user has complained that the internet is slow, I'm dropping packets, uh, and it's just not good right now, and I can't do my job. So let's take a look and it's coming, for, the complaint is coming from a remote user. So let's look at demo number two here. 
Again, it's about 1.3 million packets. Okay, 1 million packets. And let's look at our top talkers again. Once again, I'll start out looking at who's the top talker. And in this case, we have a number of them. Look at here, we've got, everybody's talking to this 167 and 168 IP address, but look, we have 142,000 packets. Our old friends, the dot 25 is still here, but look here at this one right here. So let's see what this is that's going on. So simply apply the filter to the selected and you go back to the capture and it analyzes the capture and resorts it and creates the uh, filter for you so that it automatically finds the top conversation. Hmm, this is TCP port 4008. Now I know that 4008 is the top talker here, but I'm curious, is this all of the traffic? So you could come up here and say TCP dot port equals 4008. And what I find is there's more than one host that this particular guys are talking to on 4008. Let's just see how bad this particular one is. So I'm gonna look at the statistics again and look at the IO graph. And if you remember, I have, I'm gonna change this to bits. Okay, let's have it re redo this. I have the top talkers already here from the previous capture, by the way. So I'm gonna have it go through and analyze this again. So all packets, show me each one of these that I know are good right now. And also show me TCP port 4008. I think when I did the trace wrangler, I misconfigured the capture, but let's take a look at our analysis here. Looks like our capture is going all the way up to 1.5 times 10 to the ninth. We're at 1.5 gigabit up here in our traffic capture right now. That's on a one gigabit pipe, by the way, guys. And of that, 800 or so, because this would be one gig, this would be 500 meg, about 800 meg of it is this port 4008. So let's step backwards here real quick. And when I anonymize this guy, let's look here, ip.addr equals, Let's look at this dot 25, which was another one of my top talkers. So this is my site-to-site -site VPN traffic. Let's see how that compares in the IO graph. It's a 
Just a sec here. All right. I only want to see these last two. Okay. So it's analyzing here. So my site-to-site -site VPN traffic are the hall packets is 1.75 gigabit on a one gigabit interface, by the way, not good. We've got this 4,008 traffic. And then we got way down here, my site-to-site -site VPN traffic. And in this case, my site-to-site -site VPN traffic is where I was having the complaints from. I would say without a shadow of a doubt on a one gigabit interface, port 4008 all of a sudden is choking out my site-to-site -site VPNs. So what we did, and in this case, it turned out that that port 4008 that I was talking about there turned out to be uh, a replication. Somebody had modified a VM that was, uh, out in Amazon Cloud and it passed through the same firewall as these and it actually was replicating back and forth on 4008. That's Zerto, by the way, that does that. Uh, Zerto is a backup application. So basically my VPN traffic was choked out. When that happens in the middle of the night, not so big a deal. When it happens in the middle of the day when our insureds are still reeling from Hurricane Ida down in Southern Louisiana, that becomes a big problem because our sites that VBNs go to our claim centers. So as a network engineer, my job is to know my network well enough so that when that call comes in, I have the tools at my hand, which I've shown you some of the tough, particularly this IO graphing tool that I've showed you here uh, to be able to know exactly what it is that's causing the traffic to be hammered away at. Um, now, it's not always so straightforward. Uh, sometimes it gets difficult when things have been uh, hidden behind firewalls and things like that. But you can always begin to look deeper into the applications and understand what's going on. As I said, the closest place to capture is right at the switch. 